Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, amen, amen. on this nice wintry morning, a little bit of snow. Now we're in full-fledged winter, huh? So something we should get used to. Just a reminder, uh, a couple things. Um, if we do close, uh, you should see it on uh, the major news stations, Wood TV, Channel 8. Um, I can't remember the other one because I don't watch TV, but um, check your, your local station. We also uh, will send out a flock note uh, if you're part of that. Um, if not, see me and I can show you how to sign up for that and get text messages from the church uh, when we're closed. And uh, then finally, uh, on our website, so you can always check that. You'll see something at the top if we're going to be closed. Um, so that's ways we, you can be notified uh, so you don't make the drive out here and find the parking lot empty. Um, so... Uh, one other thing, um, if you uh, if we're still not taking normal tithes and offerings, but if you would like to do that, there's two ways to do that. One is in the back, uh, in the center, there's a box, and out that door is a box. You can uh, put your love offering or uh, tithing there, as well as you can uh, give using uh, the MyWell uh, app on your smartphone. With that, if you would stand with me, let's open with God's Word. If you'd like to read along, we'll be reading Romans chapter 12. Verses 6 through 16. Romans chapter 12, 6 through the first part of 16. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord." Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecu persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. And all of God's people said, Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. What a great reminder this morning, Lord. You build the body. And what a, all of us have a different part to play. And none of us have no parts. We all have a part to play. And Father, we should be loving to one another, serving one another. These are to be our focus, uh, our brotherly love. That's how the world is to know that we are different because of the love we have for one another. And so, Father, I pray by the power of your spirit, you continue to work in our body to build us up, to love one another as you have commanded us to do, and that this community would know that you are here. This is your church that you are building. May you be glorified. May you be praised. We pray by the power of your spirit as well this morning, Father, that you would make your word known to us, open our hearts and our minds to receive it. And that, Father, we would continue to be transformed into that perfect image of your Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. And to that end, we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Genesis chapter 1 and uh, third John, or probably 1 John chapter 3. So Genesis chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 3. Right now, as you're turning over there, I'd like you to listen to something. All right. That's the heartbeat 
of our granddaughter, who at that time was four months old, in the womb of her mother, just about a month ago. She, we found out as a little girl, as I said a couple weeks ago, she's a little longer now than a banana, right? So we're pretty excited that we're going to have our second granddaughter come May. So this morning, I'd like to speak on the subject of the miracle of human life. The miracle of human life. Life. You have your Bibles open to Genesis and also 1 John 3. We'll be in 1 John in a few minutes. Again, this morning, as always when I speak and as I reference this last week, just to emphasize this, I believe this is the Word of God. I believe that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. I believe that every other voice that we might hear today or in any age is fleeting, but God's Word is solid and secure and is like a rock. We only have two choices before us. We can submit and listen to the Lord Jesus Christ as he speaks to us in his word, or we can choose to go our own way. As Isaiah 53, 6 says, everyone has chosen to go their own way. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse, Therefore, choose life. And in the book of Proverbs 16, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. All the way through the Bible, you have one way or the other. There's only two ways. Psalm 1 speaks of those who scoff at God's word and those who delight in God's word. So this morning, again, my presupposition is that this is the word of God. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. So how did human life come to me? Uh, Have we all evolved from lower life forms? We began as a slimy mass somewhere, somehow, and here we are today in all of our abilities and creativity and intelligence and put people on the moon. We can do incredible feats. How did we get where we are? How did human life come to be? We saw the scripture last week where Jesus said, referencing to the book of Genesis, that from the beginning of creation, this is in Mark 10, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. At the very beginning. Jesus is referencing here in Genesis chapter 1. You have your Bibles open to verse 27. Genesis 1.27, so God created, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Notice three times the word created is used in that verse. Life came from God. Life is a gift from God. Chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 7. Again, Genesis 1 is an overview of God's creation. Genesis 2 gives us additional information. In 2 7, the Bible says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Life is from God. Life is a gift from the Lord. Hebrews 11 reminds us, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The creation had a beginning. The creator did not. The creation started at a particular point. Life started at a particular point. God breathed into the man. His nostrils, the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. The creation had a beginning. The one who did the creating did not. He is eternal. In chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 21, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib 
that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made, God made into a woman and brought her to the man. God has created man and woman. God has given life. God is the creator. God is the life giver. So that is the first main point I want to see this morning. That's the starting point. <clears throat> God is the giver of life. We didn't just happen. We're not a mistake. We're not an error. We're just not a blob, right? We didn't evolve over millions of years. No, our ancestor does not live down over the hill in John Ball Zoo, right? We have been made, it, made in the image and likeness of God. He created us. Adam and Eve were our great, 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 great grandparents. Right? God is a giver of life. Consider these verses. If you're taking notes, think about Job 12.10. Don't try to turn there, but think of Job 12.10 that says this. In his hand, in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. That breath you and I just took is a gift from God who is the giver of life. God chose to give us the breath, and God will choose to end our breath. The time of our entrance, the time of our departure is in the hand of the Lord. We have a friend who passed away a few um, weeks ago. His wife said, COVID did not take my husband. This was in the plan of God. God numbered his days exactly. And Rich was about 69, 70 years of age. Dear brother in the Lord, God's timetable was completed for our friend and brother. In Psalm 139, you formed my inward parts. This is a picture of life in the womb. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depth of the earth. And in Acts 17, he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and Everything, the breath that we just took, the, the meal that we just partook of, right? The, the blessings of sunshine, good to see sun. It was total overcast when we left this morning, seven inches of snow, right? I, I looked at radar, we're driving into the sunshine, that's a good thing. God gives to us life, God gives to us breath, God gives to us everything, comes from his hand. He provides for his people. In the book of Genesis, we read in chapter 4, verse 1, where did life come from? God gives life. What happened? In chapter 4, verse 1, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Adam and Eve came together, and a little baby boy was born nine months later. In chapter 2, or probably chapter 4, verse 2, and again she bore his brother Abel. Now they have two boys, strong, young, strapping, you can just see him running and playing, boys. The Bible says in verse 25 of chapter 4, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. A third son was born. In chapter 5, verse 1, it continues in the line. Verse 1 of chapter 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man whom they, when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. God created Adam. God created Eve out of the side of Adam. And Adam and Eve had other children. 
year after year after year. And so that the text goes through in chapter 5, verse 6, when Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. In verse 9, when Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. In verse 12, when Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. And so through chapter 5, God gave the gift of life as a man and a woman, husband and wife, came together, had a physical relationship, babies were born. God is the giver of life. Later in Genesis, we read that Sarah, Abraham's wife, conceived and bore Abraham a son. Where did life come from? God caused conception to take place in the womb of Sarah. And then in Samuel, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. Nine months later, there's little Samuel. When Zechariah, the priest in the Gospel of Luke, had finished his responsibility that for that particular time as a priest, the Bible says that he went home, and after these days, his, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and nine months later, John the Baptist was born. And this to an older couple. And then we've got to love in Luke chapter 1. You remember when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is with child. And Elizabeth uh, is six months further along than, than Mary, who's carrying the Messiah. Elizabeth is carrying John the Baptist. And the Bible says there, you can read it in Luke 1, verses 40 through 44, that when Mary came into the house... The baby within Elizabeth's womb leapt, leaped up, started doing somersaults, maybe started singing hallelujah chorus. Why? Because the Messiah was present in the womb of Mary. And that word brephos is used, a little baby in the womb leapt in praise at the fact that Jesus was present in the womb of Mary. That was a little baby. John the Baptist was a little baby, six months along in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth. Jesus was a little baby, six months younger in the womb of his mother, Mary. And then I love when Paul is writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, you can read about it, that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. And in chapter 1, it speaks of Eunice being uh, Timothy's mother. And I can just imagine Eunice, a godly woman, a godly mother, singing to her boy. From a child, you've known the Holy Scripture. It's the same word, brephos, that's used by Paul, that's used in Luke. In Luke, it's, it's a brephos. The baby leaped, John the Baptist leaped in the womb of, of Elizabeth. And here is in 2 Timothy, the word brephos. So, so I can hear Eunice singing to her unborn son and to her is also used as a little newborn baby i said last sunday night don't wait to well i'll wait till my kids or children are five years old then i'll start training them in the things of the lord no start five years and nine months before start as soon as you know ladies you're pregnant you're in your family you know grandkids are pregnant great grandkids are pregnant as you talk with people in your family start training children while they're still infants in the womb That's what Eunice did. Where does life come from? It comes from God. God knits us together in our mother's womb. We heard the heartbeat of that little baby girl beating in the womb of our daughter Hannah. It's a miracle of God. That comes from the Lord himself. Do you know something else? In Genesis chapter 9... We read an interesting verse. Did you ever put this together and think about this? That God created the family in Genesis 1 and 2, and God created the government in Genesis chapter 9, and the Bible says that he created government for the purpose of the fact that human life is so valuable that if anyone takes the life of a person, their life is to be taken. If anyone sheds the blood of a person, their life, blood is to be shed. That's the purpose of government. Look at chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God has made 
man in his own image. Human life is so valuable that God said, you don't tamper with human life. You don't come along and take things in your own hands and extinguish the life of somebody else. And so God establishes government to deal with wickedness, to deal with evil. This isn't, again, somebody taking matters in their own hands. It's the purpose of government. The Bible says in Romans 13, to deal with evil. Romans 13 says, he, speaking of the government, those in authority, he is God's servant for you, for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Right? God established government, Genesis chapter 9, to, for the purpose of dealing with evil, of restraining evil. So when sh blood is shed, when someone considers taking a life and does take somebody's life, it is a responsibility of government to deal with evil. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 2 when he says this, speaks of governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. And so when you see a police officer, you say, there's a minister of God. My nephew is a deputy sheriff. He is a minister of God, right? Our sheriff in Berry County loves the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a minister of God. Sheriffs who do not know, love the Lord Jesus Christ are ministers of God. State troopers are ministers of God. Uh, FBI are ministers of God to deal with evil, to deal with wickedness. That's the purpose. Exodus 20, God placed this, these words into the Decalogue, into the Ten Commandments. One of them was what? You shall not murder. That's the word murder. Okay. You don't just take things into your own hand and step out and take the life of somebody else. That's not your responsibility. It's not res my responsibility. If somebody does evil, it's responsibility of government to do, deal with evil. So God is the giver of life. Where did the miracle of life come from? It came from God. It came from the Lord. We're, we're not accidents. We're not just errors. We're not mistakes. Every one of us have been built by God, created by God, crafted by God. He is the life giver. But I want you to see number two this morning. Satan is the life taker. The Lord is the life giver. Satan is the life taker. God is the giver of life. Satan is the taker of life. Now, we know from God's word that Satan was originally created by God, sinless, as an angel, Tremendous talent, tremendous ability, very musical, very, very intelligent. Worship God, beauty, beautiful angel, and in arrogance, chose to defy God, chose to disobey God, chose to lead one-third of all of the other angels in rebellion against God, and he's already fallen. He's already defied God by Genesis 3 because we find him coming to Eve there and to Adam. And he says to the woman in Genesis 3, 2, did God actually say? He's maligning God's character. He's attacking God. He, 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 is, he is saying of God that God cannot be trusted, that God is not good, that God is not kind, that God somehow is holding out on Eve and cannot be trusted. You need something else, Eve. You need something more. And I just happen to be the one who can deliver. We find through the word of God <clears throat> that while Satan cannot kill God, because Satan is a creature, God is the creator. While Satan cannot kill God, he strives to kill those who are made in the image of God. He assaults God by assaulting God's creatures. He attacks God, maligns God, by going after God's creatures, you and I. In Genesis chapter 4, let me show you this. You have your Bibles open yet to Genesis 4? We'll be to 1 John in a few moments. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 4, we read about 
Cain is born and Abel is born. And we read there that Abel, that uh, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, Genesis 4, 2. And Cain was a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Abel was received, Cain was rejected, so the Bible says Cain became angry, verse 5. His face fell. You ever see an angry person? You can tell it by looking at their face. He became angry, and God in his mercy is reaching out now to Cain. He's extending grace to Cain. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door like a leopard, like a, like, a, like, a, like a lion ready to leap on its prey. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. God is so good coming to Cain, extending mercy to Cain, calling Cain back to the fold, back to the place of safety. Does Cain listen? Verse 8, Cain spoke to his Abel, his brother, and when... They were in the field. Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Cain did not listen to God. This is premeditated murder. This dawned in the heart of Cain, and he carried out that wicked, wicked, vile deed. Now, this is where I want you to look at the verse in 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> Look at verse number 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now look carefully at verse 12. We should not be like who? Cain. Who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Here's a New Testament commentary on what took place in the book of Genesis. Folks, listen. Who was it that incited Cain, who stirred Cain? Cain was completely responsible for his actions, but who is there fanning the flame of this thought that came into Cain's mind I am angry at my brother. He has been received. I have been rejected. I'm going to do something. Who is the one who continues, as it were, to pour gasoline on the flame? It was the evil one. Do you see that? Don't be like Cain, who was of the evil one. And how did he manifest that? He murdered his brother. Now, to be sure, God had said to Satan, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. Satan is scanning carefully. He knows Abel's position before God, and he hears Cain's words, and so he knows it has to be Abel. And so what what does Satan do? He instigates in the heart of Cain to murder his brother. He doesn't want the line of, 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 of Eve to crush his head. He hates God's creatures. He despises what God has made. John 8, 44, when Jesus is speaking of Satan, one of the ways he describes him is this. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was a murderer. Satan is a murderer. He's a murderer in, 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 in Adam and Eve's lives by stealing life from them, eternal life. He's a murderer in taking, stirring the heart of Cain to murder his brother Abel. Satan is a murderer, Jesus said. He has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of life. Satan is a murderer. Friends, Jesus is a life giver, isn't he? Satan is a liar, but Jesus is the truth. Satan can't kill God, so he strives to kill those made in God's image. Cain was absolutely responsible. 
Ecclesiastes 9.3 speaks of the fact that the hearts of the children of men are full of evil and madness is in their hearts. Utter madness is in their hearts. But there was one there fanning the flame. Let me just use this, uh, this example. If you talk to a fireman and there's been an arson, very often they'll find something called an accelerant has been used in the building, for example, to help spread the fire, like gasoline, right? Like, like paint thinner, like newspaper even, dry newspaper. That will make a fire go much quicker than if you just set it here uh, uh, in the middle of the room, an accelerant. So let me suggest to you that the devil was an accelerant. In, 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 in this man, Cain, Cain, totally responsible for his actions. Cain grew angry. Cain refused to listen to God. No question about that. But Satan is there. He's of the evil one. Cain is of the evil one, as it were, pouring the gasoline on the, 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 uh, the heart of Cain and then lighting the match and then standing back to see what's going to take place. See? Genesis 4.16, again, talks about the line of Cain. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He left God. He spun on his heels, walked away from God. One of the saddest verses in the Bible is Genesis 4, 16. Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. God had come to him, called him to repent, called him, welcomed him back, come back, come back. Cain refuses, refuses, refuses. He spins on his heel. He does a 180 degree he walks away from the presence of the Lord and settles in the land of Nod. Now, what you have now here in chapter 4 is the line of Cain. The line of Cain, the family line of Cain. And we meet a man by the name of Lamech. Notice a few verses later, Genesis chapter 4, verse 19. Lamech took two wives immediately we're seeing that Lamech is disregarding God's blueprint that he's already established in Genesis 1 and 2 Cain is Cain has disregarded God now Lamech is disregarding God here and taking two wives first polygamous that we're aware of right his attitude is I'm standing in the way of Cain I'm going to do my own thing I'm going to walk my own path it gets worse. Look at verse 23. Lamech said to his wives, Ada, Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have what? Killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. This man's actions illustrate what the psalmist talk about in Psalm 10, that the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul and the greedy for his curses, and he renounces the Lord in the pride of his face. The wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there's no God. See, Cain's attitude, and now Lamech's attitude is, listen up, women, you might end up the way this man did. I, I think this might, be, this might be like a threat on them. You better do what I tell you or else. He's boasting of the fact that he's killed someone. He's murdered someone. He's enthroned self. He's dethroned God. Now look at chapter 10 of Genesis. We're giving you, showing you how Satan is the taker of life. Satan stirs the, 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 the fan or fans the flame, stirs the pot as it were. He incites, he stirs, he pushes, he urges. He seeks to extinguish any direction toward repentance. No, don't go there. Don't go there. Genesis 10, 8, we read about a man by the name of Nimrod. Genesis 10, 8, he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And you go over to chapter 11, and you find there in verse 4 about this kingdom 
Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. What did God say? Disperse. What was, what was Nimrod and his descendants saying? We're going to stay right here. We're going to build this ziggurat. We're going to build this tower to heaven because we are God. We are enthroning ourselves as masters. Nimrod exalts himself. It's like in the little book of Obadiah that Bible says, the pride of your heart has deceived you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? So again, who fueled this attitude? Who is the one who hates God? Who is the one who despises God? Who is the one, though he cannot kill God, he strives to kill those made in the image and likeness of God? It is Satan. Satan is the taker of life. Satan stirs hatred in the hearts of people made in the image of God toward people made in the image of God. He's the agitator. He's the accelerant. And the very weakest of those made in God's image are the little ones in the wombs of their mothers. Very weak, very vulnerable. The slaughter of babies is the enemy of our soul shaking his fist in the face of God saying, I dare you to do something about this. I am God. I am master. I am Lord. I am king. I'm going to do it my way. So, very basically, God is the giver of life, and Satan is the taker of life. The slaughter of infants is satanically energized. The devil, I believe, fueled Pharaoh to tell the Hebrew midwives, if you have a daughter, she can live, but if you have a son, you must kill him. Of course, again, the enemy is at work trying to extinguish the messianic line. He doesn't know when or where exactly the Messiah is going to come. But he seeks, he strives to destroy the little baby boys. Of course, we're familiar with Herod, so enraged because the wise men did not follow his directions. Everybody followed what Herod said. Nobody dared lift a finger against Herod. He was the big man around campus. When he was so enraged by that, he sent word to murder all the little baby boys in and around Bethlehem. And then we find an interesting passage. You need not turn there if you want, but just jot it down. In Revelation, I think it's in your notes, Revelation chapter 12, which gives us insight as to Satan's hatred against Messiah, against babies, against infants. The dragon, chapter 12, verse 4 of Revelation. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Who is this child? She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. It's beyond beyond question who this is. It's the Lord Jesus. And here is Satan ready to devour this child as he is born. Destruction. Satan, the Bible says, is the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now is at work. And it's the word we get energy from or energize. The enemy is energizing in the sons of disobedience. There's no way the darkness, the hideousness of what we see in our culture today can be explained only by humanity. There has to be one fueling this like an accelerant behind it. He is the energizer of the sons of disobedience. He's the prince. He's the spirit. He's energizing what we see take place. He cannot kill God, so who does he go after? Those made in God's image, he can seek to slay them. 2 Corinthians says he blinds minds. I I was reading today in World Magazine, this early this morning, World Magazine. Here is is a nurse who says, I go to the hospital, I help deliver babies, and then I, uh, other parts of the weeks, I will distribute uh, certain medicine that women can take uh, to, to kill their babies in the womb, and I so enjoy this, I'm serving women whatever they want. That's, that's twisted, blinded thinking from one who, uh, who is the prince of the darkness. How could anyone think like that? How could the thinking be around today that 
If a woman finds out that she's pregnant, it's better to kill the baby because she should not get bonded to that baby. So just eliminate the baby early on so that you don't become bonded because it wouldn't be psychologically healthy for the woman to become bonded and then later at some point have to give the baby up for adoption perhaps. This is satanically energized. 2 Corinthians 11, the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning. So your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The devil's still at work. And in Colossians 1.13, we read that his, his domain is the domain of darkness. That's his realm. That's where he operates. The devil doesn't come out into the light. He doesn't explain exactly who he is. He, he operates in the shadows. He, he loves the darkness. Again, Jesus said he is the light of the world. The devil is the prince of darkness. In Romans chapter 3, there is an entire list of Scripture from the Old Testament, one right after another, describing our, our, our lives without God. And one of those statements is found in that third chapter. It says this, Their feet are swift to shed blood. Paul quotes there in Romans 3 from Proverbs 1.16, Their feet are swift to shed to shed blood. Proverbs reminds us in chapter 6, these six things the Lord hates. Now, when God makes a list of the Bible, we better listen up. When man makes a list, well, maybe, maybe so, maybe not. When God makes a list, we'd better listen. Here are six things God says he hates. Seven are an abomination to him. Number one, haughty eyes. Number two, a lying tongue. Number three, and you can read the rest of them, the third one is hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that shed innocent blood. Feet that are swift to shed blood. Isaiah 1 speaks of your hands are full of blood. King Manasseh filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. And then the psalmist talks about there are those who eat up my people as they eat bread. Think about that. There are people who are so callous, so hardened, that they eat people as they would sit down and casually eat a meal of bread. Their minds have become so twisted, they're such a pawn of the evil one, they're completely responsible for their actions, but their thinking has become so twisted, their thinking has been so turned around that they're sitting down eating people as they would eat bread. That is, they're destroying people, they're, 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 de they're taking uh, people out, they're, they're, they're doing injustice to people, they're doing wrong to people as they would sit down and eat a piece of bread. In your notes here, there are three places to fill in. The question is this, what connection is there between Charles Darwin, Adolf Hitler, and Margaret Sanger? Answer? Darwin set forth the idea of a superior race. And Hitler came along and put it in practice. And Sanger came along and put it in practice in the United States. Hitler in Europe, Sanger here in the United States. Listen to the, the title of Darwin's book. Here's the origin of species, the origin of the species. But here's the full title. The Origin of Species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. There. Originally published November 24, 1859. That's what Darwin said. Darwin pursued what is known as eugenics, a super race. Eugenics is the improvement of the human species by encouraging or permitting reproduction of only those people with genetic characteristics judged desirable. That's what he said. That's what Darwin said. Hitler came along some 70 years later and sought to create a super race and murdered millions of people in Europe, Jews and other groups of people because they didn't fit the criteria. They didn't meet the standard. Then Margaret Sanger, who was born in 1879, died in 1966. The founder of Planned Parenthood said this. 
Quote, more children from the fit and less from the unfit. That is the chief aim of birth con control. And quote, Superman is the aim of birth control. She said, birth control means the release and cultivation of the better racial elements in our society and the gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extirpation of defective stocks, those human weeds which threaten the blooming of the finest flowers of American civilization. Sanger started what was known, became known as the, quote, Negro Project, unquote. The purpose was to reduce the black population through birth control. It's no surprise, where are Planned Parenthood offices today? By and large, they're in low-income areas to go after people. Tragically, in 1927, the Supreme Court made a ruling, Buck versus Bell, that called for compulsory sterilization. Ju Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said this, along with seven other justices, I quote, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough, unquote. Buck versus Bell, 1927. We come to Roe versus Wade nearly 50 years ago. Another horrible, horrible decision by a handful of people. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The devouring of destruction of human life is the satanically fueled assault on the creator himself. Those made in God's image bear the, bear the brunt of Satan's hatred toward God. Satan cannot kill God. He knows his days are numbered. He knows the end in the lake of fire. And so in, in evil rage, he takes it out on those made in the image of God. Those who carry out abortion are completely responsible for their actions. Now, what shall we do then? How shall we live? Let me give you six suggestions. Number one, we need to continue, continue in this day to unashamedly proclaim Jesus Christ. No hesitation, no reservation. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The devil is the murderer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The, the devil takes away life. The devil is a liar. You cannot believe him. And we're going to continue to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Christ unashamedly, as Paul said in Romans 1. Number two, we're going to seize every opportunity we can to speak up for life. Every opportunity we can. The reason our daughter had a, they call it today, gender revealing party a couple of weeks ago was another opportunity to put on a social media that this is a little baby and this is a baby girl. And I'm so proud of her for doing that. We saw a whole string of pic ultrasound pictures the other day, probably three or four feet of pictures, you know. You could take any child two or three years of age, and say, what is this? And they would say, that's a baby. That's a little baby at four months old. Little children are wiser than many, many, many with great long degrees after their name. Number three, adoption. Adoption. To encourage adoption. And have you ever thought about, since adoption is so expensive, assisting <laughs> a young family to adopt a child. Adoption. Number four, be sure to vote for those who hold to the truth that from the very moment of conception, that's a human life. You'll see Brother Dan this morning, he can tell you about Judge Kathleen Feeney, who's running for Court of Appeals, that includes this area, clear down into Barry and Allen County, where we are. Very solid pro-life lady. These words are in a party platform here in the United States. Quote, 
believe that every woman should be able to access high quality rep re reproductive health care services, including safe and legal abortion. I want to just say to you, I never, I've voted for decades. I, to my knowledge, I have never voted, to some, voted for someone who is not solidly pro-life. And I don't ever plan to, right? I'm going to continue in that way. I'm going to continue in that stead. But here is a platform of a party in the United States of America who is making a statement like this. I don't have anything to do with that. I'm going to step back from that, see? God is a giver of life. That's up to the Lord. Vote. Vote. I think everybody here this morning probably could see Dan this morning, and if you haven't already signed, do so. Number five, pray. Pray for people to be saved. First Timothy 2 says, pray for kings and all those who are in high positions, that God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved. People need to know the Lord. This is a spiritual problem. See, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, right? Ephesians says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against four times, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This isn't a Sunday school picnic. And so when we talk about prayer this morning, we're talking about something that's hard work. We're talking about this. This is a matter of a spiritual dimension. It's not just working out and working, getting physically stronger, praying to end abortion as we've seen that so many years, right? We're not physically wrestling against matters. In Isaiah 59, there is this tremendous statement of hope that is given in a passage that is very specific when it talks about in Isaiah 59, Verse number three, your hands are defiled with blood. Your hands are defiled with blood. But here is this, the, the hope, verse one, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. See, the problem is not that God's hand cannot reach down and save anybody. The problem is not that God's ear is dull and he cannot hear the cry of someone saying, Lord, please be merciful to me, a sinner. The problem is that we've separated ourselves from God. Even those who are defiled with blood, if they will turn in repentance, they can be saved. Thank God, anyone who has performed abortions or had an abortion, the Lord said, even if your hands are defiled with blood, the Lord's hand isn't shortened that he can't reach you and the Lord's ear is not plugged that he doesn't hear your cry for mercy today. These are not beyond the, the hand and the ear of God to come to know the Lord. We need to be praying, though. And we need to understand that people are not the enemy. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. People are pawns. They're puppets in the hands of the enemy. Kermit Gosnell was not the enemy, is not the enemy. He's still alive, to my knowledge. He, was a, he performed abortions and horrid situations in the city of Philadelphia. Kermit Gosnell is not the enemy. He was a pawn in the, in the hands of the enemy, the devil. And you're like Kopfer, Kopfer, Klopfer, I'll get it right. You're like Klopfer was not the enemy. Klopfer was a man who performed abortions and has since passed away. But two years ago, next month, February of 2020, the remains of 2,004, 20, 2,411 babies were buried in one mass grave in South Bend, Indiana. We're not talking about Los Angeles or downtown New York. We're talking not far south of here. In that cemetery, two years ago, the remains of 2,411 babies were buried in that grave. You may remember that after he died, 71 boxes of parts of babies were found in a garage and other baby parts were found in the trunk of a car. Now, these men, they are fully responsible for their actions, but they're pawns of the enemy to go after the, crea the creator's men and women, boys and girls, infants. The pawns carried out what the enemy could not do. The enemy could not kill God, but the enemy can seek to go after those made in the image of God. So this kind of prayer is hard work. 
William Gurnall said, this war is so serious that it makes the cruelest battle between armies seem like child's play. Have you ever been to Gettysburg or Antietam or, or Iwo Jima or, or Normandy? That, that looks like child's play next to the battle that we're in against the enemy of our souls who hates God, who despises God, who hates anything connected with the Lord and goes after those made in his image. So we recognize how weak we are. We stand in the strength of Christ. We pray without ceasing with our families. We pray with other believers. How is your prayer time? We can all improve. Number six and last, how shall we live? We need to keep loving our spouses. We need to keep improving our marriages. We need to keep caring for our families. We need to keep working hard to communicate with one another. We're not to be running from problems, but using what the Word of God says on how to work through differences, because what kind of moral platform, quite frankly, can we have who profess to know the Lord when our marriages are in a shamble, when the divorce rate is so high among professing Christians? What kind of moral platform can we have? Well, we're going to speak out against abortion. See, we need to be men and women of God, and even when tough times come, work through those challenges. When we are stuck, get help, work through those issues so that we can have some type of platform to speak from that says, this is right and this is wrong. So as I wrap up, we started with a verse in Deuteronomy that said, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse, therefore choose life Run then this morning to the giver of life, to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. There's hope in Christ. That Isaiah passage just popped out at me this week. Here are those here, verse 3, whose hands are defiled with blood, okay? Your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. Okay, you're unjust. You don't go to law honestly. You rely on empty pleas. You speak lies that conceive mischief, give birth to iniquity, hatch adder, adder's eggs, weave a spider's web, eat the eggs dies, and from one who is crushed, a viper is hatched. The whole picture there is of this wretchedness of sin, of darkness. But the Lord is there, still reaching forth his hand. The problem is not that God is somehow withdrawn his hand, the problem is not that God is, is, is dull of hearing. The problem is that we have, verse 2, our iniquities have separated between us and our God. So there's hope. <laughs> we set forth the gospel of Jesus Christ, that in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, who is the way, the truth, and life, he is the one who gives us life. If we will repent, if we'll turn, if we'll say to God, God, you're right, and I am wrong. You're right, and I am wrong. And you know what? That's some of the hardest words ever to pass over our lips. That God is right and I am wrong. But won't you come this morning to the giver of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Lord, this morning we thank you that you are the life giver. From the very beginning with Adam and Eve, you created Adam, you created Eve out of the sight of Adam. You brought that couple together. They had babies. You, we see through the scripture how you brought Abraham and Sarah together. You brought Elizabeth together with Zechariah. You brought Eunice together with her husband. And, and babies were born, conceived and born. You're the life giver. You are the giver of life. But the enemy hates you. He cannot kill you. And so he seeks to kill those made in God's image. And so, Lord, with every breath that we have, with every tick on the clock that we have left, may we be those who proclaim the gospel of Christ without hesitation, unashamedly, regardless of what my others might say, what, what, what the cost may be, that our allegiance is Jesus Christ. And I pray that it would be very, very clear to anyone who is here this morning or anyone who will ever listen online that the Lord Jesus Christ extends forgiveness. There is compassion with him. You were so compassionate toward Cain when he was so arrogant. He was so angry. You called him back. God, we thank you for your mighty, mighty grace shown toward us. And I pray if there's any here this morning who did not know the Lord Jesus, that he would humble themselves before you and call upon the name of the Lord, that today would be the day of salvation. 
We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.